Moore, substituting for Dr. Bill Deagle here on the Nutra Medical Report, along with Ms. Ann Morrison. Good afternoon, Ann. Uh, good afternoon, John. Well, things are happening fast in the um, in the radio host world. Well, they are. They are. We're getting some very disturbing news about our friend Doug Hagman, uh, Northeast Intelligence Network, and um, I know Doug, and, and it looks like there's some things going on there, and I'm not sure exactly what's transpired yet, but uh, we may have more details that we can report uh, accurately by Monday. Uh, I know... Uh, one report I got from our friend was uh, that he had been physically attacked and, w- and was seriously injured. So um, that remains to be seen exactly what's happened in the circumstances. Anyway, and uh, earlier this morning on my show, uh, we were talking about the uh, human-to-human uh, transmittal of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, a MERS for short, and how this has uh, raised this uh, virus to a whole new level. Uh, a whole new level of concern, hasn't it? It certainly has, and uh, even the CDC has now come out with more um, guidelines, and they have increased the incubation period. They, they, they were at 10, but there was really no reason for them to be at 10 uh, days because um, there's, no, uh, there's no measurement. They don't know what causes it. They don't know how it spreads, so they don't know when people first get it, and then they don't know when they, how long it takes them to come down with symptoms. And so the incubation period was just uh, set at 10 based on other viral incubation periods. And now they have um, updated it to uh, 14 days, and that means if somebody comes into the hospital and is diagnosed with MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, then they'll go back 14 days and try to contact everybody who that person has seen in that time and then follow them to see if they develop this uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Well, if if that person happens to be a flight attendant, for example, (laughs) uh, (laughs) what an absolute nightmare. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's true, and uh, the case fatality rate uh, for people who end up in the hospital is 56%. They have not found it in the blood of anybody who hasn't been hospitalized, and in fact, they don't even look, they're saying now that what, you, what they need to do is they need to get a lower respiratory sodium sample, and they can take those they can take them, but it's a very uncomfortable procedure, and they would have to give you a light anesthetic of some kind in order to get in there. So the best thing to do is if you have a respiratory problem and you have a uh, productive cough, is to cough up some sputum before you go in so that they have a fresh sample. Uh-huh. Uh, the procedure involves uh, a really big, really long needle, I assume. Well, yeah, they got to get to the bottom of the lung, right. and uh, it, this is not a pleasant procedure. I wouldn't think now, so. Yeah, they have t- some sampling with the nasal pharynx swabs did not detect the MERS uh, in um, in patients that had it, and that's why they want the lower respiratory tract specimens, and uh, so that's a priority for collection. In addition to having the regular swabs, which are easier to get, you, you know, they swab the inside of your throat. Right. right. So it, this, this particular virus likes to have a, uh, a cozy little home down in the bottom of your lungs, apparently. Well, and um, most of the people that get it have underlying, have other chronic diseases, but not all of them. The, uh, uh, all the, the, the range of ages for the patients are uh, age two years. To, uh, uh, to age 93 years, and the average, age, the median age, now that means that half of the cases are above 56 and half, right. half of them are below the age of 56 is 56, and um, of 55 cases, 31% were fatal, which gives you a case fatality rate of 56%. Right. Now, well, that's, that 56% fatality rate, it seems to me unusually high. Does that, does that raise some red flags in terms of the possibility of this being a biological weapon? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, you know, it's, it's similar to SARS. Now, they were able to stamp out SARS because the transmissivity was very high and the incubation was very short. And so as soon as people got it, they got sick. So it was very easy then to find their contacts 
and asked them to quarantine themselves. And uh, so they had an incubation period that was very short, and so they had to quarantine themselves for, I think, a week or 10 days. Now, there was one man in Canada who would not quarantine himself. He continued to go to work, and the pressures of providing for your family and going to work are, you know, they're very strong. I mean, right. it's very hard to get somebody who is the breadwinner for his family to stay home, and especially if he's threatened with being fired and uh, if he stays home. So uh, they finally put him in jail. But uh, they were able to stamp out SARS. Now, this MERS is related to SARS because it is a coronavirus, um, but it is not SARS. And so I, I'm calling this laboratory, uh, bio laboratory try number two. And whether the laboratory is in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula or if it is outside the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and the Saudi Arabians are the, are the target, I don't know. But in any case, uh, they don't know how it's transmitted. There may be somebody going around with an atomizer spraying it in the air. There could be somebody that's uh, touching things and leaving uh, fomites on them that other people then touch. And uh, there have been cases where people have been taken into the hospital and either their roommate got it or uh, the people who took care of them got it, medical personnel got it. And they don't know what's transmitting it, so they don't know what the incubation period is because they don't know when that person was first exposed. It sounds like uh, there's a lot of very serious unknowns here, Ann. Very, very serious. Now, I talked to Dr. Bill Deagle, and uh, he reminded me that as we are adapting to this new virus, and it is a new virus for humans, and they have not found any reservoir in any animals. And they have, you know, they have talked to uh, people and said, well, did you, did you visit any bird markets, you know, live bird markets? Did you go to the zoo? Did you uh, pet a camel? Did you go on a camel? <laughs> you know, all these things right, that you right. might do. Right. And they all said no. And uh, so they have not, I mean, they have tested different animals in the Middle East, and they have not found a reservoir. Um, of this particular virus. So what Dr. Bill Diggle uh, reminded me of was that as we are adapting to this virus, the virus is adapting to exactly. us. And that is, in this, in, this, in this instance, what happens is that the virus that sustains itself, in other words, it doesn't die out, is the one that's going to be around. Right. And so the, the more transmissible it is, and um, the, the incubation period being what it is, then, uh, yeah, the virus is going to get stronger. It's going to get more transmissible. And when the basic reproduction rate exceeds one, then we will have an epidemic. Okay. Describe what that means. The, the AC production rate exceeds one. What, what's the significance of that? What does it mean? Yeah, that is a... Uh, that is a uh, thing that the epidemiologists use, and um, it's called the, I may have called it the wrong thing, um, R0. Where is it? It's the, the rate at which the, the uh, virus replicates, and not only that, it has to do with how many people a, person, a patient will infect. So if the uh, patient, if the basic, um, if the person, if the patient has a, uh, is, will infect one person and two, then their, they call it an R naught number, it would be 0.5, because it takes two people for them to pass it on to one. And uh, if it's one, in other words, if one person passes it on to another, uh, then that's an R naught of one, and uh, an R an R naught of uh, two would be if if a person approached two people and both people caught it. Okay, well let's, let's hold that thought in. We got a break coming up. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hold on, Tim. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back. This is J.R. Moore and. Uh, and Morrison, and we're joined uh, for a quick update here by Tim Alexander. Welcome aboard, Tim. Hi, thank you. 
John. Uh, a couple quick things here. Uh, one, um, in talking about uh, the latest viruses that are beginning to spread, when you design a virus, a computer, uh, a, 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 a advanced uh, recombinant DNA genetically engineered virus as a bioweapon, you, any one virus you may have many, many different copies of. And uh, the, among the things you look at is, is how much of a viral load does it take to cause an infection in another human being? Is it UV tolerance that is it will sunlight kill it? Uh, and what's the incubation period? Is the person uh, a vector for that entire incubation period and so forth? Now, as we're going into the Third World War, uh, there will be, I think there's a playbook here, and they, the powers, the, 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 the globalists and the uh, Netanyahu Zionists know that uh, they need, there'll be a point at which they'll need to lock everybody down. The economy is collapsing, and they don't want a revolution. Well, the, what's better to lock people down than the fear of a bio war spreading? But at the same time, they don't want uh, that bio war to be to be blamed on the, the new the expanding Middle East war, which will become the Third World War. They don't want to take the hit that they caused this directly or indirectly. Right. Right. So you've got plausible deniability. You've got something that's been out there for a couple months, and. Um, uh, as time goes on, they can introduce different variants of the same virus. Of course, what you have to keep in mind is the Iranians spent uh, a great deal of money, and about 21, 22 years now since the fall of the Soviet Union, they, they imported many of the top scientists uh, from the USSR after it, it imploded. Uh, in their BioPreparePat program, and they have a very advanced BioWar program that is a doomsday weapon system. It's if you kill us with nukes, Israel or the United States, NATO, we will respond by killing you with our advanced BioWar. Right. And uh, so, anyway, so the, the, we're looking at a plausible deniability and. That's one thing. The other thing I wanted to, to touch real quick here, uh, and I want to take up a bunch of your time, uh, there have been, that I know of, uh, and I know you guys are aware of it too, at least three people in the alternative media that have uh, just within the last couple of days faced some really serious uh, hacking attacks. I'm one of them. Dr. Deagle is another, uh, and Paul Martin, uh, RevolutionRadio.org. Uh, is the third. Both Paul and uh, Dr. Bill literally had to take their computers in the shop. Mine wasn't quite that bad, but it's right. still not it's still not totally fixed. And we all run the best antivirus software, the best anti uh, malware software. You name it, we've got the best. And uh, the people that got through. Um, at one point, I think I had 47 infections. Right. Uh, the, the, this was not uh, your run-of-the-mill hacker. This was uh, an intelligence agency hack. Right. Uh, worse than that, uh, Doug Hagman of the Hagman and Hagman Report uh, was physically attacked, we were told, last night. Um, and I think the uh, bastards are playing hardball as we get ever closer to World War III. I think they're going after the alternative news media right. and the people in the alternative news media. So if you're in the news media, the alternative news media, watch your back. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's getting a little hairy out there. They hate the truth, and we are the purveyors of truth. And the only ones out there. They yes, the truth. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there are we are many. They are very, very few, and uh, that is a, uh, a hangman's noose hanging over their head, and they are fully aware of it. Um, that's all I have. Okay. Uh, well, Tim, I appreciate the, the update. Yeah. Okay, for John calling. and Ann. Nice okay. talking to you. God bless. Thank you very much. Thank well, Ann, it looks like uh, things are are getting a bit serious here, doesn't it? Well, you know that we're on the list. We're on the DHS list, and uh, I'm sure that we've both been uh, vented. Vented, is that the right word? Vetted. Vetted. 
by uh, local police and maybe even uh, the FBI. Um, you know, you can't, you can't, today, in today's world, where we just found out that the NSA and the FBI are gathering everything that's said or written into big databases so that they can mine that and find out who's talking to who, um, certainly being on the alternative media is a, is a, uh, is a detrimental uh, individually for us. Well, it, it tells me, all this tells me, Ann, is that we're having an effect. If we weren't having an effect, they wouldn't bother with targeting uh, people like Doug Hagman and, and uh, Steve Quayle and Paul Martin, myself and you. Uh, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't bother. But we are having an effect. We are waking up people, and uh, that makes them fearful of us. So uh, I guess we just need to keep on doing what we're doing, don't we? Well, you know, it's like those early printing presses that were in America that printed out the, the, uh, you know, the the little uh, memos. I guess we call them memos now, but the little newspapers that told the citizens what was going on. Right. And uh, and the British would come in and they'd break them up and they'd, you know, they'd harass the the printers and the editors and anybody who was involved in that business. And, yeah, I think we are having an effect, and I'm glad that we are because I don't see any civil defense. I don't see any credible civil defense effort here in the United States. Right. Well, uh, I agree with you. I agree with you, absolutely. Um, and something we haven't talked about for a, a, a while is the events with uh, Fukushima, Japan. What's going on over there? Well, it's very interesting what's going on over there. <laughs> um, um, let's see. <laughs> I got to get the right one. There is a the, okay. Uh, Fairwinds. Are you familiar with Fairwinds? Fairwinds uh, is uh, is the um, uh, is that uh, well known uh, radiation specialist that's on YouTube. I, I guess I'm not familiar with Fairwinds. That's oh, soon, well. I might assume so. Okay. Well, anyway, they went over there, and what uh, when it first happened, they've been back three times since then. And um, one of the things they discovered was one of the things they discovered was that the readings that were being posted in public from uh, radioactive detection meters uh, differed from from uh, what they were reading with their instruments that they brought with them. And they calibrated theirs. You know, they made sure they were calibrated, and right. so they approached the Japanese, and they said, uh, "Your your instruments are reading the uh, the same as ours. They're about thirty percent low." And the next day, they were reading the same, and they blamed the cable or something. Apparently, they they hadn't been calibrated or something. The other thing was that when they used the uh, meters, of the detection, the radiation detection instruments that they had brought with them. Uh, was that there were patches of fungus on the bleachers at the school's baseball field at one of them that had sucked up radionuclides really? to such a degree. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back. This is J.R. Moore and Ann Morrison, substituting for Dr. Bill Deagle. And uh, let's proceed talking about the uh, radiation events at Fukushima, Japan. Yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, they were surprised that the, the Jap their Japanese co counterparts didn't do anything, didn't seem to be worried about it. In fact, according to the story that they tell on Fairwinds, uh, they actually sat on it and they have a picture of them sitting on this bench. And uh, the person that wrote the story for the English uh, YouTube said a boy sitting on that patch uh, of fungus on that bench to watch a baseball game could do real damage to his gonads. Uh, it's 70 times the contaminated asphalt. And, the, and what they were saying was that if they don't clean up the radiation immediately, then the radiation interacts with the surface that it's sitting on and it right. becomes bonded to it. Right. So wow. cleaning it up after the fact is very very difficult. Now, of course, they were they were over there hoping to get a contract to do the cleanup, as well as other American companies, and none of them were selected. They went with the uh, in in country a Japanese firm to do the cleanup, and they went back three three years later and said, well, it's 
We're still reading a lot of radiation. So. Are we into the third year of the Fukushima event now? Well, 2011, March. Well, 12, 13, well, 13. well this would be the, yeah, we're starting the third year. Oh, I'm okay. sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. It's the second year, but they've been over three times. Okay. So on their third trip over, which must have been in, this year sometime, they, uh, they said it's still highly radioactive, and they're not sure that the cleanup is being do done. And they're they're citing the fact that once the radiation has set for a while, it, it get bonded to the surface. And apparently, I think that this is a real uh, find. Is if this if this fungus, if they could uh, bring home some of that fungus and uh, test it to see if it could clean up radioactive material, uh, and if it could. <laughs> I think that would be a real. Um, I think that would be a real help to our radio nuclear uh, community. I think it would. It would. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Now there's another. There's another story coming out, and this was published on uh, today over in Japan, Kyoto News, and uh, he's been examining these uh, uh, patients, mostly farmers, who. Uh, uh, um, who have stayed and, and continued to live in that area, that they're not in the uh, evacuation area. And when he first started, that was uh, two years ago then, that um, they used to be very robust and they had powerful voices. And uh, now, you know, two years later, uh, they're a unable to stand without assistance of family members. Um, some even need wheelchairs. They look depressed. And uh, there's, uh, you know, there's, he's just saying they're stressed out. Right. They can't farm. Um, you know, there's too much radiation in the soil. So, they, and they don't want to leave because their ancestors lived there. You know, so society, right. or societal uh, feelings are, you know, are that I want to stay here. And uh, so they're they're trapped. You know, and so they're getting depressed. Is is the way that I right. would read that. Right. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a shame. It's just an absolute shame, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, one thing about Americans is that uh, they moved and they moved and they moved. They moved from England, right. and then they moved west, and then they moved um, past the Mississippi, and then the gold rush happened. They moved all the way to the next ocean before they stopped, and and some of them even went to Hawaii, apparently. <laughs> And who knows how far we would have gone if, if we hadn't uh, been stopped at that point. Right. But but uh, the Japanese are not like that. They have a very homogeneous society. Um, they worship their ancestors. And, uh, you know, it's just that their society does not help them in this particular instance, in this in this disaster that's occurred over there. Right. Now, we've got radiation coming in, and according to a diplomat from Japan, it's going to be coming in across the Pacific Ocean for the next hundred years. I mean, the tip of the iceberg is just what we've seen being washed up on the shores of California, Oregon, and Washington. And besides that, you've got the cesium uh, problem. France has sent out and uh, gathered information on cesium deposits along the west coast of the United States and into Canada, and uh, there's considerable cesium-137 being deposited. Uh, you know, when the winds carried the, the cesium and the strontium over, um, the, it ran into the Rocky Mountains, and so the wind slowed down, and it dropped, you know, it dropped what was in it, which was the radioactive cesium and strontium-90 and other um, radiological materials. So the, the whole West Coast, the growing part anyway, is heavily contaminated, contaminated with radiation. And uh, across the bottom part of Canada also, I might add, it went, it went um, got through the Rocky Mountains in the lower part of Canada and then just went pretty much east across the Great Lakes and then to the northeast and then out across the ocean to Greenland and uh, England. So there were cases where it came down into the Midwest, but in the Midwest we do have electrical storms that go up 60,000 feet, and when those, when the water uh, drops form, they form on that radioactive material and, and bring it in out of the air. So we were fortunate here in the Midwest to have that kind of um, weather, uh, that kind of climate where we do have uh, 
of thunderstorms that will clean out the air up to 60, maybe even 70,000 feet. Right. Right. Now, um, but that means that, uh, I, you know, we talked earlier about the children, about the uh, marriage possibilities for the girls that are being raised over there in Fukushima Prefecture. And, uh, you know, they're, they're becoming less marriageable because of the health effects that they are suffering from. You know, they're no longer as healthy as girls that are being raised in other parts of Japan. So their eggs are and, being radiated. Well, and that they didn't factor that in, but yeah, eventually people are going to read read something that tells them, oh, you mean that strontium ninety that they didn't measure got into our uh, bones, and uh, you know it's, it's going to cause birth defects and it's going to cause cancers and it's you know it's going to uh, it's just you know we're going to have more abortions and more stillborns and and more miscarriages. Oh, well, maybe I don't want to marry your daughter. You know, you've been contaminated and you're just not marriageable material. I'll go further south where people, where right. girls are, are more healthy. And we may have some of that here in the United States, um, especially uh, California girls may not be as attractive as they, as they once were. Of course, it's hard to say the, the demographics are changing and the society's changing, and I don't know how many men want to raise families anymore. You know, it used to just be uh, what we did. You know, we got right. up, we got, right. we grew up, we got married, we had families, and uh, then uh, then society changed. And I don't know when it changed. It changed when I was when I was raising my family. You were, you were busy. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it moved away from me. Now I do want to mention this um, nuclear waste tank at the Hanford site. The Hanford site is on the Columbia. River, it leaks radiation into the Columbia River. Maybe they could use some of that fungus up there. And uh, they they have especially a tank, and they have a number called an AY-102, and it holds 860,000 gallons of, they say, radioactive waste. I think it's probably mixed waste. Um, generated during decades of plutonium production. So this is a double-walled uh, container. So it's got an inside, uh, it's got a barrel inside of a barrel, and they're they're X-raying it or something so that they can tell. Um, they know that the inner container is leaking, and that uh, there's uh, leakage into the into the space between the two containers. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're calling this um, liquid bright green. The new video of the waste shows much more bright green liquid than wicker than workers had seen before, and the presence of green wet material means it is new. So that's, you know, I don't know what happens to it when it gets old, but apparently it's not bright green. All right, all right, hold that thought in. we got a break. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back. Jim, we're back. This is J.R. Moore and Ann Morrison substituting for Dr. Bill Deagle here on Friday, the 14th day of June. And we've got several more topics we could cover briefly. Uh, which one do you want to start with? Well, I want to talk briefly about Hanford. And, okay, uh, please do. The, you know, Hanford has been a problem. They've known about the leaking for at least 40 years. I studied it in, in environmental school. And... Uh, so it, you know, it's, it's a well-known problem, and they were supposed to have solved it, and they didn't solve it, solve it. And so now they've got a, they still got a problem. And meanwhile, uh, when you've got a mixed waste mixture, then you don't know what what compounds you're forming. Some of them apparently are gaseous, and they have to burp these ba- barrels. The last thing they did was they buried the barrels, which means that they can't turn them to burp them. Right. And not only that, uh, apparently the barrels, because they don't know what's what's being formed. Some of what's being formed is caustic, and it's eating holes through the through the uh, inner barrel, which is where the liquid is stored. Well, that's and then uh, they think it will leak through the outer barrel. And meanwhile, while these things are buried, and and so uh, they got the same problem that they had 20 years ago, except that they have to unbury the barrels in order to. I don't know. Maybe they'll put them in an even bigger barrel. 
<laughs> All right. The other thing is uh, Palisades nuclear reaction, and that's in Michigan, and it has been dumping radioactive water into uh, Lake Michigan, and um, not a lot. And then uh, they've had uh, continuing problems for the last three years. They discovered there was a leak in the control room, and uh, that's been going on for two years, and they, they didn't find the source of the leak. They just you know, fix the leak, put a bucket under it, I guess. And uh, then uh, they finally discovered that the leak was coming from a uh, water tank that sits above the plant's control room. And really? that tank was leaking. So they finally went up there and looked at that, and they discovered that it hadn't been installed properly. <laughs> so now they, they're not going, they were supposed to have a sand barrier underneath it, it was some kind of drainage, and I guess they didn't put the sand on it. Who knows? You know, you're going back to as built versus as designed. It was designed to have have sand under it. It doesn't have sand on, under it. So what they're going to do is they're going to put some kind of liner under it so it doesn't leak anymore. In the meantime, the Palisade, Palisade nuclear plant has been up and down for the last three years. It was... Um, Finally bought in 2007 by Energy, and uh, uh, was sold by CMS Energy Corporation. Wow. And uh, so Energy is the one that, that is now um, is now the one who who has the has to fix it. And uh, they're saying, well. Uh, there's been other problems. An operator left without permission or without handing over duties to another qualified individual. They left a uh, control room <laughs> with nobody in charge. Really? I mean, yeah, they're, they're having all sorts of problems there. And then they had a bus breaker failure that was in 2011. And then um, uh, uh, an auxiliary feed water pump con comes on as, though the, as if the main pump fails. And uh, that controls the water flow between the reactor and the steam generators. And uh, they don't know why it came on. And uh, they finally, in, um, let's see, I'm trying to get down to 2012, they've had several meetings. Uh, Palisade sues the federal government uh, over lack of waste storage. And uh, Palisade safety rating gets up degraded from one of the worst in the country. <laughs> And uh, so the public's been involved in this, and Congressman uh, Fred Upton apparently is the person who, who, is in, who is their representative. So anyway, it's down again, and they, they'll get that water storage tank fixed. But it seems to me like they've got bigger problems. They've got uh, operational problems as well as, as uh, uh, physical problems to me. I mean, that's the way it seems like to me anyway. Well, I think your assessment is probably right on there, Ann. And this comes back to the uh, my mantra that, and, and yours also, of preparedness. Uh, that people should be prepared 24/7 to deal with anything that comes along, and uh, that's a good way to live your life, isn't it? Yeah. Now, I just want to talk briefly about the storm that we had. Um, you know, they called it a um, derecho, and you may not have heard that term, but they do have derechos. And I looked up the statistics. Historically, we don't have one uh, across the middle part of the eastern part of the country, except maybe once every t two years, and now we've had two in two years. And uh, derechos are not uh, tornadoes, although they can spawn tornadoes, you know, or you can have a system that will spawn both a derecho and a tornado. But it's mostly a high wind event, and uh, we certainly saw a lot of damage. There was a tornado outside of Washington, D.C. Now, what we have is we have r rising ocean levels. The rising ocean levels means there's a bigger surface for water to evaporate from. That puts more water into the air because we have more evaporation. When you have more water into the air, then you're going to have easier transport of hurricanes across land. In other words, when Superstorm Sandy came into uh, New Jersey, um, it, it came in there and it just kept going. 
Right. You know, it didn't stop when it got to the land. Uh, now, I remember in my lifetime, and probably in the last 20 years, when hurricanes would uh, disintegrate into a tropical storm and then a tropical depression, and by right. the time they uh, they exited, maybe uh, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico, and they'd go up, they'd become a tropical storm, then a tropical depression. By the time they got out in the Pacific, in the Atlantic again, there was nothing left of them. Well, that's not happening these days. There's, um, these storms that, are, that this last tropical storm that came in that started in uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, it's our first one. It crossed over the isthmus of uh, Florida without any problem. I mean, it just and then it went up the coast. And it's like there's so much water in the air that these hurricanes aren't stopped by land. And I think that people are worried about that now. When I look at the jet stream, you know, the jet stream used to go around around across the northern part of the country in pretty much a west to east direction and uh, then they had what they called the southern jet stream that appeared in the summer well now we've got a jet stream that seems to be broken and uh, as you've discussed um, the effect of the of the uh, of the warm water the gulf stream that used to go up the east coast of florida and then into uh, then warm up um, the northeast and then cut across the ocean and and warm up Spain and England and Norway and before it would circle back and come down uh, Greenland and then reach the uh, salinity pump at the tip of Greenland and plunge downward into the bottom of the ocean and then travel back to the warm waters of the Indian Ocean. Well. It looks like that because the Gulf Stream has stopped now, the, I won't say the jet stream has stopped, it's just become very broken up. And there are cases where you've got two jet streams. You've got one that, that is up by the Arctic Circle, and then you have one that is, is further south. You know, it, it's at, instead of being, uh, it's not at the equator, but it's definitely at, uh, well, we're at 40, so it's probably at 30 degrees latitude. Right. And there's and there's quite a large swath of that, except that it's broken, and some of it seems to come from, well, it seems to go into the art, so it's going from south to north, and that's a really strange way for the jet stream to go from south to north, <laughs> especially in the northern hemisphere. Right. You, 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 you just don't expect that, John. No, so uh, some of the strange things that are going on in the weather world. Um, could be due to the to the brokenness of the jet stream, and uh, in in addition to the amount of moisture that is now being contained in the air. Now, what's going to happen, and what we saw last year was that it snowed over uh, the Great Lakes in the Great Lakes area, uh, and we're still waiting for the snow to melt. Now, if that snow melt doesn't occur in southern Canada. And I haven't heard that it flooded the Mississippi River or the Missouri River. Then uh, it will it will lay on the ground over the summer, right. and then uh, when it snows next year, it'll build up. Right, right. That's exactly what'll happen. So we're talking about an ice age. Uh, that's been talked about on this show before, hasn't it? Yes. I think we're out of time, Ann. Well, it's fun, John, but, it was uh, fun. you know, there's, there's tragedy out there. Next week and uh, uh, have a great weekend, Ann, and, and everybody else out there. Have a great, fun, safe weekend.